In the United States, comprehensive immigration reform has proven elusive, a seemingly insurmountable goal, poisoned by divisive rhetoric and political infighting. That's why I invited three distinguished immigration scholars from Cornell Law School to take us through their new white paper, entitled Immigration Reform, A Path Forward, which outlines reforms that could be implemented in border management and asylum policy, worker programs, and dreamer protections. Even though comprehensive immigration reform looks unlikely to move forward in Congress anytime soon, these scholars make a strong case for targeted reforms that are urgently needed and, most importantly, potentially achievable. Here's my conversation with Steve Yale-Lair, Randall Johnson, and Teresa Cardinal-Brown from Cornell Law. Steve Yale-Lair, I'd like to begin with you. This paper was written and produced by a team of lawyers and scholars at the Immigration Law and Policy Program at Cornell. Who are all of you and what do you do over there? Well, thanks to foundation funding, we've been able to put together a dynamite team of visiting distinguished immigration scholars, including Randy Johnson, Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Amy Nice, Charles Kamasaki, and Marilena Hincapié, who all have very distinguished immigration careers. But we decided that we could do a lot together that we couldn't do individually. Our views range from the left to the right on terms of what immigration policy should look like, but we all work together very well. And this white paper is one of the efforts, the fruit of our labor, so to speak. So the white paper is called Immigration Reform, A Path Forward. are going to be providing the URL in the description and the program notes for this podcast. So Steve, what was the impetus or the driver for this report? What's the end game here? Well, the impetus was that we decided to do a conference at the National Press Club last February on immigration reform. For years, there have been efforts to do comprehensive immigration reform, cover all aspects of immigration reform. And based on the 200 plus people who are at that conference, we decided that really comprehensive immigration reform is not possible anymore, but targeted reform could be possible. And we identified three areas that we thought are both politically achievable and are necessary if we want to start working on changing our broken immigration system. Those three areas are border management and asylum reform, worker programs, and the so-called dreamers. And those areas, I think, are form the basis of our white paper, and we'll be talking more about each of those three areas in detail in a minute. Are we dealing with a set of circumstances that make these especially viable now? I'm asking because we're in a, we're in a difficult political climate. I'm wondering about the viability, the feasibility of of getting these three things done. Why are they attractive to you and why are we focusing on them right now? Well, we think these are areas where the American public and members of Congress have said both now and in the past that we need to deal with these three areas at least. As you'll hear about in more detail in a minute, the Dreamers, for example, have been around for 20 years, but we still don't have a legislative solution for them. Everyone is talking about border issues. And there's certainly a need for more worker visas, as Randy will talk about. So we think these are three areas that if we can tackle these areas and get consensus on how to deal with these areas, then we'll be able to tackle some other aspects of our immigration system. Teresa Cardinal-Brown, I'd like to turn to you. Your area of focus in the paper is border management, security, and also asylum reform. Migration across the southern U.S. border has changed dramatically in recent decades. Now there are new law enforcement dynamics at play. We have a drug smuggling crisis going on concurrent with a migration challenge, right? And the problem seems to stem from the fact that we're addressing drugs and migration as as kind of one thing. Tell us why that might not be the best approach and what you recommend. Sure. And as you mentioned, I think this stems from the fact that in the last decade, especially, we have seen a dramatic shift in the type of migration and the migrants themselves that are coming across the U.S.-Mexico border. So for you know 150 years, most of the migration across that border was Mexican, single adults, usually men who were coming into the United States looking to work for a while and then go back. What we're seeing now is a significant increase in families unaccompanied children. And from places, you know, in our hemisphere, Central America, South America, and Caribbean, but also as far away as Cameroon and Uzbekistan, we've seen Afghans and Indians and Chinese come to the U.S.-Mexico border. So, you know, the migration crisis, as it is part of a global migration phenomenon that's happening right now, more people on the move across the world than any time since World War II. We have to match that with, as you mentioned, we do have a drug crisis in this country, a fentanyl crisis, much of which is coming from Mexico. 
But what it's not happening is it's not really coming via the migrants. It is coming mostly through ports of entry, mostly smuggled by U.S. citizens or permanent residents who are less likely to be really significantly questioned when they come back in. But the fact that these are happening at the same time at the U.S.-Mexico border has created this sort of merger, at least in the way people are talking about the border, when the solutions are drastically different for the two areas. So we're focusing primarily on the immigration aspects of these asylum seekers, many of which are turning themselves in. But we also address the criminality too. There is one linkage, and that is the criminal drug cartels are also facilitating the smuggling of people, both for monetary gain for themselves, but also as a way of diverting our resources from doing the work of finding their drugs. So we do need to address both of them. But as I said, I think that we think the solutions are somewhat different. So, Teresa, I want to follow up on that. These seem like common sense recommendations, but how realistic and attainable are these solutions, given how divided Republicans and Democrats are on immigration, the border, asylum? I know we're getting a little outside of our purview here as far as muster, you know, mustering up the political will to get something done in Congress. But, you know, how about the attainability of these? Well, you know, right now, as we're recording this podcast, there are serious conversations happening on Capitol Hill about changes to our immigration policy at the border, resources both for addressing drugs and migrants at the border as part of this big supplemental package. It's being mixed in with aid to Ukraine and Israel and aid into our Indo-Chinese allies. But it's happening right now, and there are serious members of Congress who are engaged in serious discussions. Of course, there's also politics involved. We know that. But the reality is they're looking for solutions. They're looking for not just talking points, but what are things that actually can work to address these crises uh, together. And our paper talks about, respectfully, certain changes that could that are necessary to our asylum system, which was designed at the border at a time when a tiny fraction of everybody arriving was looking for asylum. And now it is the majority and that system is completely overwhelmed. So we do need to have policy changes there. I mentioned the law enforcement impetus to go after the cartels who are smuggling people. We also looked at the management of the system. It's decentralized. We have five different cabinet departments and 20 some agencies involved in our immigration system. We want to have, at least in the White House, a centralized coordination office that we suggest an office of migration policy to help with this. Because when Congress is looking at solutions, they're talking to 20 different agencies in the government about what those solutions look like. And those agencies don't always agree. The good news is that we have had interest in this part of the paper because those conversations are happening now. I couldn't give you odds on whether or not they'll land the plane they're working on right now. But I will say this. We need Congress to act in this way. What we have seen through three administrations now are efforts by presidents to try to address this crisis with the limited tools they have available to them under the immigration law. And the result of that has been limited success or no success based on what they're doing and a bevy of litigation against it, which is that we have not had any consistent policy. The only way we overcome that is if Congress says this is the strategy we need to try at the border and they enact that strategy and fund it. That will help stabilize things, at least. Randy Johnson, your section of the paper tackles new worker visa programs. The situation is that we've got entire industries, healthcare as an example, that need skilled labor and trained workers. Tell us how you think about the problems and solutions as it relates to worker visas. Yeah, Chris, and you, you use the word new. Let me just state I've been working on worker visa issues probably going back to 2001 with Senators Hagelin, Daschle, and McCain Kennedy and Rubio later. The most recent S744, where I negotiated a deal with the AFL CIO on a broader, lesser skilled program. I mention it to say that. It was likely those issues more controversial back then, and I do feel in a weird way, unlike other areas of immigration reform, we've made progress on the worker shortage issue and the need to amend our laws to, bro- to provide for a broader, lesser skilled program, whether it's in healthcare or broader, which I'll talk about, I think is, is, is more accepted than it, than it used to be. Now, the paper goes into to a couple of programs, but let me just mention that one of the reasons it's, I think, there's a growing acceptance is that 
Well, you hear about employers all the time about worker shortages across industries, but I want to emphasize that the demographics are just unarguable. No one can contest that we have a lower birth rate and we have an aging society. And therefore, whereas our society used to be sort of premised on a triangle of older people at the top and more workers coming at the bottom to pay Social Security and, frankly, to take care of the older workers, one of which I'll be at one day, that's changed into like a square. And we have less people being born and an elderly population. I mean, the demographics are clear. I won't go into it. But one, as baby boomers age, 10,000 people turn 65 every day with someone turning 65 every eight seconds. These numbers were repeated in a front page above the fold article in the New York Times today called Desperate Families Seek Affordable Home Care, which I'll come back to. But this is a crisis. The demographics are clear. The unions can argue about this and that. The right wing can argue about this and that. The demographics tell us we've got to have a solution, and that part of that solution is increased immigration. And I think there's a greater acceptance of that. Now, the paper goes through a couple of ideas. I'll start with the healthcare one because in healthcare services, and I'm not talking about big pharma here, and I'm not talking about the insurance companies, uh, but healthcare services such as hospitals and also in home care, where most people now recognize I think they'd rather stay in their home than go into a hospital or elder care, that there's an extreme shortage of people who are willing to do those jobs and come into homes and do the work. That's just a, a fact. And we think that in that area, most Americans will understand that fact. And congressmen can explain this simple fact on the House floor. And I worked in the House for 10 years. It's got to be simple. And straightforward, but this is a straightforward message. Healthcare is important. Elder care is important. We have a shortage. Immigration has to be part of that solution. Let's do something. So it should be a fairly simple concept to the extent anything is simple in Congress these days. Uh, so that's one of the solutions, which is a visa targeted at the healthcare services industry, which is actually unique in the fact that it's industry specific. The other one is a broader solution focused on all industries in the lesser skilled area construction, restaurant, roofing. That's been baked for some time in past legislation. We think the discussion we have in the paper at least proposes a base from which could be negotiated with the unions moving forward. We recognize it's not a solution, but it's a base from which good faith negotiations could be held. And again, that's been baked in for some time now, probably more, more than 15 years in past legislation. The specifics I won't get into, Chris, prevailing wage, et cetera, et cetera, of which there are many which have to be negotiated. The last one, a third one, is just states' rights in the sense of, as Teresa mentioned, Congress is in gridlock, so state governors have come forward and said, okay, you guys can't get your act together. Let us propose a proposal to address our worker shortages by giving us some flexibility within the law to do compacts with other states or whatever that we can bring in the workers we need to service the industries we have in our states. There's some flexibility to do that, but frankly, it's all caught up in preemption now. And as Teresa mentioned, it just leads to endless litigation and makes lawyers rich, which makes Chris, makes Steve and I uh, happy. But it's not good for America. And so there's some flexibility here that could be granted to states to provide state-based worker programs generally. And there seems to be a bipartisan consensus that's needed. Again, there's some consensus on it, but it's very complicated when you dig into the details. Randy, I have to ask, so how might the border visa proposals also help border security? Where's the connection there? How does that work? Yeah, no, I, I'm glad you asked. It's not self-evident to most people, I think. But in reality, if you had a orderly worker program by which you could bring immigrants in to fill available jobs, and these would be screened, checked, that would reduce the so-called job magnet that draws illegal immigration into a lot of the industries in which employers hire people. Knowingly or unknowingly, sometimes it's knowingly, but often it's through the E-Verify system and it's unknowingly. But if you take away that magnet of jobs and fill it legally, that takes away the pressure or incentive for illegal immigration, and that helps border security. Steve Yalair, I want to go back to you. The final section of the paper covers dreamer protections and what's known as DACA, or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Where are we at now with uh, dreamers and DACA? So we need to define our terms here. DACA is a specific program started by President Obama in 2012 for a specific set of children who are in the United States without status. And a larger group is the so-called dreamers, people who were brought into the United States when they were young and are still here without status. The DACA program only helps those individuals who came before 
June of 2012. And there are about six to 700,000 of those individuals right now. Under the DACA program itself, they have a relief from deportation for two years and they can get work permits. But that's not the entire population of people who are here without status who entered at an early age. It's been estimated by the Migration Policy Institute that about 2.3 million people would fall into that bigger dreamer protection. The DACA program itself is under attack. It's been struck down by a federal court in Texas and is now on appeal. And people are worried that next year or so the Supreme Court might strike down the DACA program as being uh, exceeding the president's authority to do something administratively. Congress has tried and failed to enact a legislative solution. And so our paper says we should attack the broader dreamer population. And the way we want to do that is not give them a path to green card because that's proven to be too controversial in the past, but give them a conditional status that allows them to be in the United States without fear of deportation. And we think that compromise, which is truly a political compromise, is something that A, the American public would agree to, and B, the members of Congress could understand both on the left and on the right. What are some of those conditions that are built in there? So, for example, right now, the DACA program says you have a stay of deportation for two years. But mm -hmm. if the DACA program were to end, then they might be forced into deportation proceedings. And we have a backlog of over two million people already in immigration courts. So that would just overwhelm our immigration courts even more. Our proposal would say that you would get indefinite protection from deportation and work authorization. So you'd have a status in the United States but it would not lead to a special green card status or citizenship status. They would have to work within the normal ways of getting the green card to be able to stay in the United States. And that is one political compromise that we hassled out among the five of us in drafting this paper, but we think it's something that the American people would agree to. Do the dreamer protections in, your, in this white paper differ from previous proposals that have come before? Yes, they do. Previous proposals had focused just on the smaller DACA segment as opposed to the larger Dreamer population. And some of the earlier proposals would have provided a path toward a green card for those DACA recipients. Our program is both broader in that it helps all Dreamers, not just the DACA recipients, but narrower in that it doesn't give them a separate path to a green card. So, Steve, Teresa, Randy, we can go around the horn here. I want to review the desired outcomes for this paper. You know, tell us what the next steps are. And I asked you in our pregame huddle, what does success look like? So, Steve, let's start with you. Success to us is having people in Washington, D.C. take our ideas seriously as part of the conversation. And we think we're doing that right now. First, we had to agree among us as to what we thought was politically viable. And that took a while. But we think that our paper does present a comprehensive way to address three key areas within immigration. And we're encouraged by the number of congressional staff and others in political opinions, op-eds that we've had that are taking our ideas seriously. So I would count it as a partial success already. And I'll take it as a total success when I'm invited to the White House for the signing ceremony. What kind of momentum do we see you know, the paper has been, was released mid-October, I think. Here we are in December. We've got a little bit of momentum going uh, now. Teresa, where do you see things? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, the, the folks on Capitol Hill are discussing border changes right now, and we have been approached by some of the people involved in those talks for more information about our ideas. I think, you know, you asked about success. Working in Washington a long time, I, call, I, I define success a little bit what I call the echo effect which is you put ideas out there and you hope that you circulate them often enough that they become part of the generalized discussion of policy solutions to a problem. And then if that idea is floated back to you by a member of Congress or another organization, like, oh, now, now it's in the realm of possibility and acceptability. And, you know, I'm with Steve. I'd love to go to a White House signing ceremony. I'm not going to hold my breath on that. But one of the other things I would just say, is you mentioned several times during the podcast, Washington, D.C. right now is highly polarized. And that's not just members of Congress. The voices they are hearing from tend to be highly polarized. They tend to be people who say we need all of one thing and all of the other, like no compromise. And they're desperate for ideas that are not, you know, hold the line, just say no. 
right? Which is what they hear Democrats hear from their, you know, progressive members just hold the line, say no. And Republicans hear from their side, just hold the line, say no. When we come out with something that says, no, there's a realistic compromise. And not only is this compromise realistic, but it actually will achieve the policy outcomes you say you want. They're hungry for that because they don't get enough of that from the voices they hear regularly. So I do think that's an important measure of success, that members that are keen on trying to solve these problems are looking for just this sort of input. Randy Johnson, what do you hope for? Well, I was at the White House when we signed the Americans with Disabilities Act, so hopefully we can do a repeat on this. I'm hoping that we can get, well, one could talk forever as to why the stalemate and dilemma we have in Congress right now with the border security being tied up with Ukraine and Israel funding need not have happened. And this was a train coming at the Congress and interest groups in D.C. that was very predictable and it could have been headed off. That's another discussion. My idea of success would be they will reach a compromise and that we can get something done on border security, including asylum reform and parole, perhaps. But that we move on to some of these bigger issues that affect the employer community and workers, such as the worker, of course, visa program that I've talked about, whether it's in healthcare or broader. The healthcare visa one strikes me as obviously a realistic and needs to be done. But I will have friends in the construction community who will say, well, we need workers too. So we'll have to we'll have to figure out those various politics within the business community as we move on. But yeah, I think something could get done if we can get this border security debate behind us. Teresa, Steve, Randy, thank you so much for coming in today. I applaud the work that you're doing at the Immigration Law and Policy Program at Cornell. Go Cornell Law. Thank you for joining me in the studio today. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss new episodes as they are released wherever you listen to podcasts. To learn more about legal issues around these pressing immigration challenges, check out the episode notes for more information on Professor Steve Yale Lair's Immigration Law online certificate programs. Thank you for listening.